Okay, we are rolling. So I'm having the class uh, say which of these photos feels better. I'll make sure you see the photo. So that's photo one. And then here comes, hang on a second. Uh, photo two, there's photo two. Let me make sure everybody gets the same experience. And then here is <laughs> photo chairs three. And you just kind of vote on which feels better somehow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Hi there. We're here. Chow quote. I'm playing with cutie pie little pumpkin. She's about five. And she gets out my big stuffed horse, which I bought for Duran years ago. She can actually like ride on, it's so cool. Yeah, I bought it for my inner child also. I've got a low voice today. Ooh, Lou Rawls, I like that, the hawk. So, so she gets these three little horses and she puts them on top. And then she says, I love this, I gotta make sure I get the quote right. They're going to horses, sadly, she says, takes turns going into the water and the alligator shark of storm water. That's the name, alligator shark of storm water. Kills each one of them. But then the wa magic water comes and you have to splash the magic water on the horses and they're revived. But the alligator sharks of storm water, God, gotta love it. Okay, that's that little piece. Intervention of the week. I have a latency age girl, and we're talking about latency today. This is the latency tape. Who ran away? Now she didn't run far, but she ran away. And she is a very spunky pumpkin, very spunky. So, yes, we did the four, remember the four pronged protocol, right? Why'd you do what you did? What's the impact on various people? What do you need to do different? Imagine yourself doing it different, doing amends. We did that. However, because she's a very imaginative child, and in a way, she doesn't have enough catastrophizing or catastrophization or whatever. I suggest that she write, because she's very imaginative, write a marvelous story. Only a scary story, but a bad outcome for a little girl who runs away. And she does, she did a very nice job. And all kinds of horrible things happen, this little girl runs away. Now what sometimes when you're dealing with a lot of kids who are very anxious, a lot of times, you want to calm them, all that cognitive behavioral stuff. With this one, I want to raise some appropriate anxiety. And I thought that might be a nice way to bridge things, because it also gets the orbital frontal, not just prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal, fantasy, imagination in that one. So know that. I have in particular an adolescent who I try to catastrophize with, because he has zilcho, at least zilcho overt catastrophizing, and he needs more of it. But we'll get to that when we get to adolescents, which is next week, which is our last class. Please, everybody, come. I know you might not be able to, but I hope you can. It's a good tape. All right. Ah, uh, what else? I always have further wars. Oh, parts. This is so cute. I have an adult client who is incredibly self-critical, and she's working so hard on that. Boy, talk about the perverse protector, the critic. And one of the things she's doing now in terms of parts, she has her present slash past part. It's really interesting. And her future part. So her present past part will do something like clean up her room so that future her, that is her tomorrow, will be happy. So she does it as a gift, and she really thinks that. She's a very smart woman, as a gift. And then in the morning, future her thanks pastor from last night for taking care of the closet. Love it, love it. Okay, a couple of furthermores. I know that last week seems like an eon ago. 
Remember Eston? Right, familial therapy, Eston, Jay, Kathy. One observation I really need to make that I forgot to make. One of the other benefits of filial therapy is you get to heal your own inner child because of course the child is the father projected into the child's state, right? So when Eston is doing all that marvelous stuff with, with Jay, as the psychoanalytic types well know, he's identifying with his own child and he's identifying with being his own dad. So he gets to reparent himself. He gets to be the dad to little Eston vis-a-vis -vis Jay that he would have wished his dad be to him. We make, am I making sense here? And I think that is one of the most powerful things of fluid therapy, is you get to do that. By the way, a footnote observation. Now, I've seen that tape so many times, but it suddenly occurred to me, wait a minute, there were four thefts that happened in that video. The first theft, and this is a little abstract, in that waiting room scene, the very beginning, in a sense, and this is all abstracting, Jay is stealing from his parents a sense of control. Remember, he's under the table. Moon, it's weird up here on the moon. I wish you were on the moon. He's stealing from them a sense of control, a sense of power, a sense of hopefulness. Because they're there in the therapist's office or waiting room. And he's already going, Nick, you can't control me. And we talked about how there's a classic shift. His own sense of being controlled being made helpless. Remember depression is helplessness, hopelessness. They're feeling helpless, they're feeling hopeless. But it's a kind of stealing from them in a way. I thought, that's interesting. Then of course he steals, remember the dinosaur? The little demonstration team? And maybe that's a lot of different things in addition to I like this dinosaur, including I want to steal a sense of fullness because I feel so empty. And as a parent you might reflect that to a kid. The kid will probably look at you like it makes no sense. So it's probably better to go with, I know how much you like that dinosaur. Then, of course, we know the first stealing is the money when he plays the scene, right? He steals that money from his dad who's tied up. And money is power and freedom and being a causative agent. And then the fourth theft, of course, is the kidnapping. But it's just interesting for this kid, that theme of repeating over and over. So that's that piece. All right. Hey, I, I sometimes leave and have that, oh, wait a minute, Shh, should I tell these people? Like, like furthermore. Any other thoughts on the, that tape and whatnot? Again, I integrate it by having parents do at home at least 15 minutes once a week if they're willing to do it with any kid that's at least up to age six or eight. Let's talk about latency. What are the tasks? What are the issues? What are they connected to? Because one of the ways it's said to look at development is what is the being connected to? Latency, roughly age 6 to 12. A 12 year old is very different than a 6 year old, especially a 12 year old girl. Tweeners are very different. But nonetheless, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, whatever. Have, by the way, footnote. So Duran and his buddies have a birthday party. The two of them, two of his best friends are close enough that they three of them had a birthday party together. Thirteen. So we hire out the YMCA in La Jolla. It's the firehouse YMCA. Okay? We invite this entire Gillespie class of 78 kids. The girls probably started getting ready. Party started at seven. I would guess at no later than noon. You would think it's the, the prom or something. You'd think it was a White House ball. It was unbelievable. I mean, they came up, uh, uh, you know, gang, gussy, the whole deal. We had a DJ and all that. The boys, of course, are shorts and t-shirts. The boys, literally, as these guys, I felt so bad for these girls. Girls are up and you got the DJ, they want to do the dance thing and whatnot. The guys are running around doing arm farts. <laughs> I swear to God. Oh! It doesn't change. It doesn't change. So I first thought how unfair it was. I felt like the weird janitor in one of those teen movies coming of age. Because I'm in the back, kind of watching these kids do their things. I'm literally I'm sweeping this area in the kitchen. I thought, this was like that weird janitor in the 
Breakfast Club or whatever those movies are. Yeah, yeah, those coming of age. Anyway, and first I thought, God, it's so unfair to these poor girls. And then it suddenly it dawned on me. I thought, yeah, the boys ought to be, oh, wait a minute. If the boys were the same stage that the girls were, I'm sorry, they'd be boinking the bushes. <laughs> this is nature's birth control. This is perfect. This is brilliant. Just have this, you know, this equanimity until they're 16, 17, whatever. So, okay, so latency is different at different times and different in terms of genders. But overall, what are the tasks? What are the tasks? What's going on? Talk to me. Anybody? Oh, God, I'm going to ask you if you don't talk. Master conservation. I'm sorry, say this again? Master conservation. Oh, yes, in terms of Piaget. And, uh, beginning, like, abstract thinking. Very cool. Right, so what areas of the brain are developing significantly? Prefrontal. Absolutely. Prefrontal cortex, dorsolateral, prefrontal cortex. Do you remember what the dorsal? I mean, again, brain is a symphony. I'm just kind of highlighting the cello section over here, but I'm not pretending it's all, not all integrated. Of course it is. But do you remember what dorsolateral is particularly kind of involved in? Social judgment. It's that which dissolves in alcohol. <laughs> That's the prefrontal, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So we have the PFC increasing. We have dorsolateral increasing. So yes, we have abstract reasoning. And my pen is dissolving. <laughs> Where's the next one? We have the next one? No, I'm stuck with you, huh? Ah, haha, I thought I had another one. Hello, talking about latency. Hi. Hi. Welcome. It's all right, glad you're here. Yeah, no, can I put it on you? Yeah. Camera close up. <laughs> no. Abstract reasoning. Acculturation. Culturation is big. They're learning rules and regulations. Reality. Remember that little cutie pie? Last week the little blonde was adopted and the little doctor puppet and then she just says, oh, pretend he's not dressed like that. Now he's a daddy. That is not latency. That's a very assimilative, I'm going to create reality the way I want it to be. Very convenient. It's very orbital frontal lobe. Magic mind. Boom, doesn't have those clothes. Latency, much more PFC, much more reality based, much more acculturated. They'd be looking for a different doll. Wait, you can't have that doll. That's obviously a doctor. Duh. Come on, don't you have one that doesn't have those un uniform thing on? They're the ones who can't stand having the figure in the sand world be bigger than the house. That little girl wouldn't care if the figure's bigger than the house. You get a late age kid, and now it's like, wait, you got to get a little figure to match coordinate. So we are acculturating rules and regulations become very important. Remember we talked about primordial shame? Remember what shame is evoked by? Do you remember this? Rejection. Correct. When you're trying to connect and you're somehow rejected, you will immediately feel shame. And again, if there isn't a rapprochement, you'll feel humiliation. Shame is orbital frontal, very primal. Guilt involves much more PFC. In it involves the um, not following of internal or external rules and regulations, expectations. So the concept of guilt now comes into play as dorsolateral develops. Yes, please. I'm sorry, can you repeat what area of the brain is the guilt? Guilt is, it involves much more prefrontal cortex. Because it, and, and dorsolateral, those there are rules and regulations. There's things I should or shouldn't be doing. And now I'm bad because I'm doing that. I stole or something. I breached both an external and an internal contract with myself. So are they still having those feelings of shame? Oh, cool. Yeah. Do you and I ever have a feeling of shame? Thank you. Never, ever goes away. It's a horrible state. Our perverse protector will, will protect us from shame and our, and our sane protector, but also our perverse one. We'll do things to avoid shame that are not good for us, including using drugs. Then we might feel guilty for having stole the money from our parents or whomever to buy the drugs to try and assuage our shame. 
never mind shame for stealing as well. But guilt is an interesting thing. No surprise then, then good old Siggy starts coming up with the irritable complex around the pre-latency and latency stage. No surprise that Stalag's book is until we are six. Once you become six, now life got a lot more complicated. Let me tell you how to parent up to then. He always just say, nobody knows what to do with a kid after six. He, he, he loves to overstate. I mean, he has a lot of ideas about what to do, he has. But it's just interesting. By the way, another area of the brain that's going boom, 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 among other areas, area 10 of the orbital frontal lobe supposedly triggers a lot when we're self-reflecting. There are a bunch of other areas that have to do with self-reflection, awareness of self. So in that, remember the good old, first it's just there is no me without a we. First it's we, mommy and I, or whatever. Then it's we, me. And you start saying, now, now, you little pumpkins. At some point I go, now. And that's the first word of identity. I am separate from you. But still, you're, you're a we, mostly, but then me. This stage is starting to be me, we. The sense of meanness becomes, if you want to say, more dominant than the we-ness. They're going to school. <laughs> That's really important to them. They're now moving outside the family. There are these people like teachers that they start to really care about outside of mommy and daddy. They start to affect and attach to, connect with. That helps develop me. They become, starting to become really attached to peers. Peers are really important. You start to, I had a best friend, I had the best friend David Maibam in Tel Aviv, not Tel Aviv, in Nechobot. And this is Shikun and And I am four. He's my best buddy. He lives right below me in the housing thing. I had a best friend, Clay Clayworth. I still remember the name when I lived in Berkeley. Friends start to become really important. And you all know about Joe McGoldrick. Ah, he even know his birthday, for God's sakes. Happy birthday, McGoldrick. November 3rd. Peers are really important. That's different. Bill Geronimo, pumpkin. One of my favorite pictures. The first moment we took him to Gillespie, he is four years old, so that's pre latency but nonetheless. And he looks, and he sees one of these little tricycles, he hops right on it. He took the picture, just a great shot. We thought, well, let's try him uh, maybe twice a week for a few hours. Oh, man, he's like, can I go back, can I go back? All right, let's try three times a week. Okay, fine, you're going full time. Within, within a month, he was full time, because he so loved hanging with peers. One of his gifts is his ability to connect with others. He's fat. He just loves peers. So peers are big. Think back to your own little pumpkins. And it matters how your peers see you. It starts to really matter. Please. When I had a client once, I was a child and, and a mom, and the child was homeschooled, and the mom was homeschooled. Yeah. And another kid would, you know, there's a big complaint that the child was on well with others and didn't interact well. This was like at a playground, you know, on weekends. It was really difficult for me because I don't know, homeschooling for me is, I, I just don't get it. <laughs> I understand. You know, just because school is such a huge part of a child's development and being able to interact with peers and teachers and all of that. Totally agree. And there's different types of homeschooling, as yeah. I've discovered, and some of which really both involve having at least once or twice a week going to some central school location and a requirement to be involved with f fellow homeschoolers of that program in outings and play things and whatnot. But my reflex is exactly the same. However, I will say my brother-in-law's kids were homeschooled, oh God, at least so I think about 10th grade. And then in 10th grade, they actually, all, each one of them, there were three kids, moved into the whole thing. And all three of them are fabulous kids. I mean, just fabulous kids in all kinds of ways, including their social abilities and whatnot. So I kind of go, okay, it can work. And the right kids, right kids, right. But I, I, exactly the same thing. And in a lot of the custody evals, because one of the things sometimes is homeschooling versus not, and you have an enmeshment going on between a parent and child, more often, sorry, the mom. I recommend they not be homeschooled. These kids need to connect with other peers. Duh. Okay. Um, Self-criticism. 
starts to happen. Again, if you have orbital frontal, peers are important, you're self-reflective, you're going to become self-critical in a different way than a little three, four-year-old when you're six, seven, eight. So you got to watch out for the critic and teach them about the critic. And the critic's trying. Did you, did you all see that article in Compassion? That, it, good. I mean, if you don't, get it. I mean, I, I emailed it to you. So I said, it's a little two pages. Very nice, because it says, hey, thank you, but no, I don't need that from you. And you do need to thank the critic for trying to guide you along, but it's hurting you. So these kids start to suffer depression in the more typical sense that we mean it. And they're very, can be very self-critical. Passions, sports, all that competence, mastery, motivation, which you know I think is really the underlying most primal thing is causative agent. These kids now start to feel and are more and more capable of doing things. And when you hit a home run and you are nine or ten years old and that team goes nuts, you feel fantastic. Obviously there's a little expletive in the middle of that. Unbelievable. I think I told you one of my favorite pictures in a sense of Duran. Duran was a really good baseball player. He's a good athlete in general. There's a shot. He, so he did winter ball. He was on an all-star team or something. There's a picture of Duran, because there are these photographers, by the way, that follow the kids. They make money that way, and then they sell it to the pictures like, ooh, to the parents or all stuff. All you see is a bunch of kids in a circle in, in baseball uniforms kind of jumping in the air, and you see this kind of bunch of dust. Well, what it is was Duran hit a home run for, and it was an all-star game. And so when he came around to home, they all surrounded him. So you can't even see Duran. But the way he fell. The, the, being a causative agent becomes extremely important when you're at this age. And they'll get involved. Again, it's rules and regulations. All of a sudden, they're very involved. And I never could figure out exactly the rules on soccer. There's all these little rules I don't get. But that becomes really, really important. And of course, the famous word, you cheated. That's not fair, echoes the halls and playgrounds of latency-aged kids because the whole concept of fairness comes into play. Fairness is when something interferes with your causative sense of causative agency. When you feel something has interfered with your ability to do what you want to do and do it well, you will think that's incredibly unfair. And you'll have a very strong reaction, especially when you're it's eight years old. I gave you the example of Duran in his, uh, after a three-day tournament, soccer tournament. They're finally all done. We go to this restaurant, they had, and in the waiting room there was this big couch. And within 38 seconds of coming there, these kids are playing a competitive game of who can slide off the couch farther. The need for competence, mastery, positive agency is amazingly strong in these kids. I remember feeling great shame. Volcani comes after Vincent. Bird Rock Elementary, sixth grade, 11 years old. I drive by that place and I see the batting cage. Place. I was kind of a cool kid. Stuart Vincent kind of was a doofus. Stuart Vincent got a good strong single. Bam! Volcani came up, strike one. Ball, strike two. Strike three. Shame. Shame. Never forget it. And, and in comparison to, right, Vincent. I mean, ah, did When he came to high school, he hey, raised the first seven years in Israel. He didn't play baseball. did soccer. And that was before soccer was anywhere around here in any kind of way. So when I was in high school, I was about to go through that shame. So what I did, amazing, I would take a tennis ball. Every day after school, I'd come home, I'd go into the garage, there weren't cars, my parents were working, so there's no car, and I would throw a ball really hard, I'd have a bat in one hand, ball, bam, and I'd practice for at least half an hour a day, because I am not going to get up in front of my high school peers and strike. Okay, we've got acculturation, we've got competence, mastery, Self-agency, we've got the importance of peers. 
Interesting starts, thing starts to happen, which you're going to see in this tape. You'll see me underscore. There starts to be the integration of and the ability to hold two separate feelings about the same entity, i.e. the antidote to splitting. Unfortunately, I once left my little notebook of all my class notes and stuff, and I never, and it got lost, because in there was a drawing that Duran did. And on one page, one side, he drew an angel and a devil, literally, angel and a devil. And then he flipped it over, and he drew an anvil, an anvil. So he actually synthesized concretely and directly the concept of an angel and a devil and put it together. That's the perfect example of a necessary task we all need to do and all falter at at various times when we get amygdalated, because we right, go right back into all or nothing. That we can hold these two things. And why are we able to do that more? Because the prefrontal cortex is developing more. The gift of the orbital frontal is the broad view. The dark side of that is all that all nothing think thinking. You're never here on your always. The gift, let me just finish the gift of the prefrontal cortex is the def definition, specificity, exactitude. The curse can be too rigid in thinking, not seeing the broader picture. Please. So if there's a very specific area of the brain that um, is involved with that integration, have they ever done like brain scans or anything with borderlines who do the splitting and can't integrate to see if that's underdeveloped or if there's any deficits in it? Not that I know of. I don't think it's just one specific area, but I think what happens with borderlines is their amygdala is firing almost 24-7. There's so much anxiety in the system. So it's the, again, my terms, amygdalation, or however you want to put that, the amygdala is going off. And when you're in the amygdala state, you're not going to do the nuances of Angeville. I can see on the one hand you're this way, on the other hand you're that. I get it. You're not going to do that. You're either fantastic or you're horrible. By the way, heroes, as you know, become a huge thing in this stage and age of the game. Huge. And now their heroes start to move from superheroes, which are more horrible frontal fantasy figures, to real people in the world. Like baseball stars and football stars and all that. Again, being the personification and embodiment of our sense of ultimate causative agency. We generalize. And I get to see one of my heroes tomorrow. Rolling Stones, tomorrow night, Staples Center. Yes! Go, Mick. 14, row 14, center stage. Thank you. I'm going to see the color of Keith Richards' pick. I'm going to see Mick's lips moving. I'm going to get satisfaction. Anyway, some heroes stay. I don't know if it's really a hero to me, but anyway, some ways. Um, but that is an, an important question Jess asked about errors of the brain on that. So, but they start to do that integration. You're going to see me underscore when she does that. You're going to see little Tara in a few minutes. I'm going to underscore when she does anything that integrates. Um, oh, then there's this other really interesting thing. So McGoldrick and I, and now we're about age 12, live in Bird Rock. There's a neighbor's orange tree. We used to love to take those oranges. We would sit on Camino de la Costa in a, we have a, that spot is still there actually. It was this bush. And it's right next to an, a uh, kind of thoroughway between the two streets, La Jolla Boulevard and Camino de la Costa. And we would wait for Cadillacs to drive by. What might be doing, what might we be thinking of doing to these Cadillacs who would drive by on Camino de la Costa, La Jolla, California? And the newer the better. Oranges, light and CH boys, hiding in bushes. We're not carjacking. <laughs> We're throwing oranges at Cadillacs. Only Cadillacs. Very discriminating. See, prefrontal cortex. We don't care about Ramblers. <laughs> Studebakers. I know these are cars that don't exist anymore. Ramblers, too. None of those. No. Oh, no. And I'll never forget this. And this, again, this is 1963. Wow. Your parents weren't even born. And this 1963 black, shiny Cadillac comes, and we're salivating, both of us, like, <gasps> and there's this old lady, 
permed hair. And I know the exact spot. And we're like, go! What? What? Right down. Why did you do it now? I look at it now, it's unbelievable. It never occurred to us, never occurred to us, never mind the dent in the car and all that kind of thing, that this poor little lady might have got <laughs> clunk, never would have thought of that. It wasn't out of malice. I wasn't hating old women that signified my mother or something. Thank you, Siggy. Never occurred to us that maybe, perhaps, maybe, oh my God, what if a lady with a baby carriage was on the sidewalk? We hit, the old lady goes, ah! smashes into the side. Now all that stuff occurs to me. Never occurred to me. There was a restaurant on the corner and went across the street on La Jolla Boulevard, just two blocks away from where I'm discussing. We would go up on the roof of the restaurant across the street. No, not oranges, water balloons. <laughs> oh, whole family, this is going to be great. As they enter the other restaurant, meow, splat, meow, sorry, splat. Hey, you kids, what are you doing? We eventually got caught, by the way. We were hiding in bushes, and we see the police. Oh my God, the police. <laughs> and we see their, I'll never forget the boots running past. Stop. Oh, fuck. Oh, I didn't use those kind of words back then. <laughs> I really didn't. Oh, gosh. Call me G. Willikers. <laughs> hey, you kids, come out from one of those bushes. Us? Yeah, you. We're caught. I don't remember what my mom did. It, she was very, again, she worked with Carl Rogers, right? She was very empathic. It wasn't a big, big deal to her. We also would go into Mayfair Market, where the CVS is now, and we would, because we were hungry. So I'd look and I'd say, I remember the peanut butter jar. I'd open up the jar, stick my thumb in it, mm, put it back. <laughs> At least I didn't double dip. I know! And this is the old type of peanut butter where kind of, you could probably see my fingerprint. You don't need the DNA. It's like, oh, well, here's the fingerprint. Just cast the fingerprint. It's like, Jesus, because it was so stiff. And I always thought somebody would open the jar. I know, I love that look. It's like, are you nuts? <laughs> open the jar, you see this big thumbprint. It's like, ridiculous. And I remember feeling so like, whatever, when we walked out, and they, the store manager comes out and says, excuse me, get back here and search my pockets. Like I would, like I would steal something. I didn't steal anything. I just sampled some of the food. McGoldrick was more in the ice cream. I was into the peanut butter. So you'd open the ice cream. What? <laughs> there is a need, a need for the, what I'm calling the dissocial. We were not conduct disorder kids. We were nice kids. Did fine in school, had good friends, cooperated with my parents. Maybe I didn't make my bed as much. You've heard those stories. But I wasn't a bad kid. I didn't have a bunch of anger issues. And no, I needed, I needed the thrill and of the dissocial. And I don't know how many, and I think it is a little bit more genderistic. Do you guys do dissocial stuff in latency? No? When we talk next week about teenhood, I mean, that's one thing I'm going to ask you, is what did you do, what's the worst thing you did that you didn't get away with? What's the worst thing you did you got away with? For some, it comes out later. But did you do it? Did you do anything dissocial and no, of that sort? No, I'm I'm thinking about something and how times have changed. Is that I have a friend of mine who was this abandoned car. Okay. And so, of course, I don't know how or five or six or something like that. So, of course, it was fun to sit in the car and make believe like we were driving. And some adult person came by and said, you know, what are you doing? That's not your car. Get out of right. here. You know, we ran for about 10 minutes, whereas today kids might flip them off or who knows what they would do. But, yeah, you know, it was like we were so scared because some adult was saying, don't do that. And we just, you know. It wasn't your car? No, it was just like an abandoned <laughs> car. Right. No. No, it was just like a wrecked car, an abandoned car, or something that was sitting there. So it was... Fair game, we thought. You know, hey, it's not our, you know, it's anybody's car. Whoever wants it. You know? Right. I'm sorry, you remember a lot of the things I did. Yeah. At first, we were, I was like, no, I was an angel. But now I'm like, oh, yeah, that. What, what was one that that you did? Um, there was this abandoned military bunker in the uh -huh. desert. Uh -huh. And uh, we'd always drive out to this abandoned military bunker and just go and hang out and explore it. Yeah. It was super dangerous. I mean, yeah. they actually tore it down. 
Oh, wow. People got killed there. Oh, great. But I'm thinking, like, if my mom knew, well, right. I'd tell her now. You know, right. Yeah. Right. Those are good. You, you start to explore the world. Yeah. You're starting to connect to the world. You're connecting the sense of adventure. Yeah. You're connecting the sense of your own power. It's really different. There was a wonderful movie years ago called Stand By Me. Remember that movie? Isn't that, oh, that's a perfect boy's late latency age movie. And there's this quest for a dead body. And they go on this quest. It's like a, uh, a Ulysses myth. I mean, it's a very powerful movie. And the most unbelievably gross barf scene you will ever see in, in the history of moviedom. If you've ever seen that, I, I won't even go into it, especially since she's eating. It's unbelievable. But yes, that need. And yes, it's really parenting now, because childing, being a child now is so different. I mean, the very neighborhood I live in, where my house is, which is old lady Sodic, my ninth grade teacher's old house, that's where I live. That neighborhood used to be teeming with us kids, and we, we owned that neighborhood. We, we would go into people's backyards all the time. We, we knew it was so-and-so's, like Mrs. Upham's place, but it just was the one that had the tree that had the hummingbirds, and you had to go through the gate around this way to get to it. And it was, and they, and they tolerated that. They kind of, we would just roam in and out of people's yards. It was our territory. It was our domain. It was like Peter Pan and the Lost Tribe and all that. There, you could map that. And we, and you know, we'd come home after school and we just go play out in the world in those streets. And when I got to be twelve-ish, thirteen-ish, I'd walk down to Wind and Sea from Bird Rock on my own with GoPro, you know, we would, and now it's, there's no kids in that neighborhood. If they are, there's some across the street, everything's very organized. You have play dates you're driven to. And you have organized sports you go to. You don't, you aren't just let loose into the streets. But it's also unfortunate because things like they have now organized trick-or-treat parties because it's unsafe, people believe, for children to like go to someone's door. Correct. Which is unfortunate that that's the case. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, the statistics about things that happen to kids are greater now. I'll never forget when I finally let Duran, I mean, Mr. Protect, walk from the karate dojo to our home, which is about three blocks, totally on his own. Yeah, he had a cell phone. <laughs> okay, where are you now? And where are you now? Okay, Mr. Independent, where are you now? Yeah, exactly. Okay, I've got you on DPS. I'm watching every movie you make. That was scary for me. Because yeah. the what if? The, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to play Russian roulette with a million to one odds. Yeah. I want zero odds. There's no such thing as zero odds, I understand. My kid, he's now, I don't know how old he was. He's probably eight-ish. Maybe a little less. But, God, I had eight in that exact neighborhood. I was all over that neighborhood. But the, but the need for the social. Because, of course, you're being so socialized. It's kind of, again, the Jungian-esque, if you want to say. On the one hand, on the other hand, light side, dark side. Video games now serve, I think, in many ways. Among other factors of all these things they serve, they also serve to get some of that to socialize. Because they're doing games that their parents may or may not want them to be doing. Or at least what happens in the games is kind of a mm, to the very social rules that they have to internalize and have to abide by. So the shadow aspect. By the way, Jung, in case you didn't catch it, in very, many ways is very Gestalt-like, because it's all about parts. I don't know how familiar you are with Gestalt. With a sense of the ancient. There's all this, yeah, but it's very Gestalt, all these aspects. So know that. OK, have we covered most everything? Passion sports, social, competence. A lot going on for these kids this stage. A lot of my happening for you. What are the implications for therapy, then? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? <laughs> the tape you're going to see is in many ways very different, very different than the Carl tape. Never mind, Carl had significant development of the delays. She's a classically latent age girl. I think she's eight. What am I going to be doing different? What am I doing right now? That's right! You get to finally ask questions without going, oh God, I asked a question. The Aaron of Alcani is criticizing me right now for doing that. I can feel it. I know I wasn't supposed to do it. It ruined the Bimonic state. 
Mirrors don't ask questions. Body, body, body. Right, you get to ask questions. I'll ask Tara questions. She's prefrontal cortex. She gets to think in that way. We get to explore. I mean, that's cool. Yes? I have a question. It was, was brought up um, by a pretty group on inpatient on Monday, and one of the patients was talking about her sexual trauma. Mm. I think it was started around age eight, I believe, until she was 15 years old. She was molested or something. By her yeah. father. Yeah. Um, and so I was just curious because we were talking about how during that stage, like being in cognitive agent is so super, super important. And it's also the time where self criticism, shame, Correct. also Correct. impacts the person. Like, and guilt. Right. And I'm just wondering, like, how a person who now, she's 67 years old, you know, and she's still holding that from when she was 8 years old. And, um, and I'm just curious, like, how would we, in a therapy session or just as a psychologist, begin to, to be able to kind of help her? Parts. Okay. Parts. The gift of parts is it's a part of you. You have an 8-year-old who was traumatized. The problem is exactly that. She identifies as a whole. This is who defines me. Maybe that eight-year-old is in the White House, or whatever metaphor she wants to use, most of the time running the show. That might be. But the way to move beyond it is to say, this part of me, and boy, is she going to have to take care of that part of her. And she can do what she told you with my molest victim. You know, the one with the wave dream. Mm -hmm. She becomes a little bubble of air. How she can take care of that inner child and make a stand against her father in the inner world. Or what, but then not everybody takes to that, but to that particular imagery, this particular client of mine did. But that concept. I, was, I worked, I saw yesterday, a very, very interesting client. He is now 20. I saw him two years ago for maybe five sessions. He is part, he can be if he wants, to be part of organized crime. I mean, really, really organized crime. Mafia type organized crime. And it's real, it's not movies or TVs and whatnot. And there's a very, there's a great pull for him. And the paradox, he comes in yesterday, the first thing he says to me, I haven't seen him in a couple of years. He says, yeah, it really bothered me. I was sitting there in my class, he's in college and all that. And I was worried, and listen to this sentence and figure out what you might immediately say back to him. I was worried whether I was a sociopath. If you're worried. Correct! <laughs> so we'd say it. If you're worried, you're not a sociopath. That's exactly what I said to him. I said, proof and pudding, dude. You're worried, you're not a sociopath. You think for a moment a sociopath's going to sit there going, I'm a little worried, I'm really worried that I'm a sociopath. I don't think so. Non-sequester, oxymoron. Sociopath worried about. And they said, you know, I kind of thought that. I said, you're kind of thinking exactly right. The point of all this, we got into the whole parts model. And for him, it just like, says, yeah, I get it. And in fact, as soon as I did the inner White House and these different parts of him, blah, 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 he's actually very, he's kind of mentored by the head guy, <laughs> the Don, of this particular, it's not the mob, but it's, it's this, type of mafia of this particular culture. He was a very nice, gregarious guy and whatnot. And so, I, so then I started saying, well, maybe the way to look at it is you have this organization that says, no, don't go there. That's dark. I'd much rather do the White House. I like the light, but I'm also drawn to the dark. And he's come up with a perfect profession for himself. He's going to be an at a defense attorney. He says, I do want to live in the light. But I, I know the dark. I feel safer with the people of the dark. We have each other's backs. I mean, it's just, it's fascinating. But what's cool is how quickly you could relate to this whole part and how that creates that. But trauma is the shattering of our necessary illusion that we are the causative agents of our lives. And that's what happened to her. And it's shattering. By the way, bad guys. Kids will do bad guys all the time, right? Whether it's pre-latency or latency age, they'll be the bad guy and the good guy. You saw it in the tape 
last week in the flow of therapy. Bad guys represent, again, the interference with our being the cause of agents. And they go against the cultural norms and our absorption. And so they're really important figures. And we globalize it. Bad guys. It's the bad. The shadow, the dark, all that. It's very interesting, that balance. All right, so you get to ask questions. What else? What else? What, as you look at these little pumpkins that are now this stage and age, treatment-wise. Well, peers are important, we said, right? One of the, it's, it's probably the single highest prediction of you being fine at 30 is that you're able to have friends at 3 and 8, 9, 10, and 13. Much, that's a much higher predictor than your grade point average or these other things. Socioeconomic class, any of that stuff washes out compared to your ability to have peers. So I want to make sure pumpkins have peers. At least one, have a friend. And if not, how do we arrange to do that? So your therapy in some ways becomes much more sociogramic. It's not really a word, but you know I mean? You're thinking about these kids in the outer world and not everybody's great at sports. Okay, so what, how else do we connect them? Again, one of the functions of video games <laughs> is you can be incredibly competent. Talk about causative agent. You know, mine, Minecraft is a fascinating game. Oh, kids are obsessed with They're obsessed. Do you, have, you, have you watched? Have you seen it? I've played it. It's actually I, a really, like, it's an amazing game. educational, cool game. You get to be the ultimate cause of agent, period. You create your universe. It's kind of cyber Legos. You're, you, you're, they're all blocks. And you create anything out of these blocks. And, and so you're God. You create. There are games, by the way, you absolutely are God. That's your job. You're either a good God or a bad God. And that's incredibly causative. And you have peer interactions. Again, you're connecting, 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 of course. You're creating. You're learning survival skills. Oh, yeah, survival skills. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. If it wasn't that it got them hooked in for 8 to 13 hours a day. So hello, there's a world out there. You know my fancy on that one was? I don't know if you know about 3D printing. It's ba three, 3D, pr you know, 3D printer basically is you draw this and then it prints this. So it makes this in 3D. It's really a different system of molding. You, so you can do anything. You can make anything. So I thought, you know, if we could, and by the way, they cost like $200,000 or $2 million. Not exactly anytime soon to your local Best Buy. But the concept, I thought, because I love that our species takes anything makes it more creative, more creative. But by the way, so there's a subculture of, of Minecrafters, and the other thing they do a lot of is they go on YouTube because, yeah, they go on YouTube to see, to get learning lessons, get tutorials on new ways of using and doing and new creations. So on one hand, we're multiplying our creativity in this incredible way, in this communal sense, but it's just all about the screen. So I thought, well, if we can get into the world somehow, but video games become a way to make contact and a way to feel empowered. But I would wish they'd at least sort of also do the real deal, comment or. Oh, I was going to say, my roommate's uh, son is in love with Minecraft too. And yeah. He actually dressed up as a character, um, and he, his big project lately has been building the Britannic in Minecraft. But he kind of transitioned that to now he has model boats. Good. So it's been a nice Heartening. Switch. And then maybe he can actually go see a real And boat. now he and his dad are doing the models together. Excellent. That, that's, I like that. That's good. Heartening. Again, our species will survive. <laughs> peers become important. You pay attention. And there are Asperger type kids who aren't really that connected to peers. But then be connected to passions, be connected to something. So if you have passions, great. How do we build on the passions you have? You're a butterfly collector. Cool. How do we do that? By the way, if, uh, yes, comment. How do you feel about group therapy? That, that was going to be my very next okay. sentence. So the other way in terms of formal interventions for these kids that you might think is and or group therapy instead of, instead of or in addition to individual. One of them Groups, but I gotta tell you, and I'm all for it, I think it's great. I will say it's really hard to teach cool. How the hell do you teach cool, man? You either got it or you don't. And God forbid you try to be cool. I'm sorry. No, and you try to be cool because you've been taught so right. Oh my God. Talk about shame. Well, I told you when I was wearing blue tennis, one of the traumas of my teen years, right? The day that it was out, 
Well, I, wasn't, I was trying to be cool, but, but that's different. But we have kids who just, they, they just don't quite get it, not in with it, and, and they're late. And so it's hard. It is hard. But yes, group therapy is important. Getting them involved in passions is important, whether it's boxing or ballet. I don't care what. Get involved in some passion. Positive peers, positive passions. OK. So any other specific? We talk more. We think more. We can use more cognitive behavioral therapies, structures of learning, teaching them about amygdalation. I actually do talk to them. I didn't in those days, but I do now. Tom I've told you about Tamara. Tamara Chansky, C-H-A-N-S-K-Y, has a whole series of wonderful books Freeing your child from anxiety, freeing your child from obsessive compulsive disorder or behavior, I'm not sure, but anyway. Freeing your child from negative thinking. It's a marvelously cognitively behaviorally oriented, child centered way of doing things. By the way, one other thing about the parts model I just realized in naming things. Whether it's the negative eighter, these crazy names, and trying to imagine little collusions between different parts. Our creature sure gets together with our principal ones. What area of the brain are we freeing when we're doing that? Rhetorical question. The playful mind. It becomes silly, it becomes playful. Now dopamine is rising. Now your lateral thinking, open problem solving mind is more engaged. So that's another benefit of all of this. And that book, that's what made me think of it. She's very good at that. Getting all this negative, heavy stuff to be more playful. Draw that part, argue with the politics. We can do that more with these kinds of kids. OK. Tamar, T-A-M-A-R, Chansky, C-H-A-N-S-K-Y. Freeing your child from, and then she has, I think, about four of them. I'm reading the negative thinking one right now. It's just great. It's great stuff. And I tell parents, get the book and do it. So we all can talk the same language. Remember, team therapy. We're a team here. I want, now, do you think, and I always say, I know you don't have the time. Believe you me, I know. Don't ever feel guilty or shame that you didn't do the assignment I gave you. But it would help. And if the kids. 10, 12, have the kid read the book with you. The optimistic child, the good old one by Seligman. It's real nice. They can start doing this. OK. I think we're ready to see little Tara. Thoughts, feelings, are we good? We good? OK. Tara came to me, brought by her mom, with the approval of her dad. She was, I think, seven. I saw her. When you see this tape, about six months. She just recently turned eight at this point. Parents benignly divorced. What a concept. In fact, you'll hear me reference uh, or something about Thanksgiving. And I even asked, was mom there at the dad's house? Because they're that cordial with each other. She's brought in because she has bouts of anxiety. There's this thing in the closet that scares her. Mom's on welfare and all of that. By the way, footnote, there is an access one diagnosis on mom that I totally missed, that you would not miss now, and that I would not miss now. I told, this, is, this is all, this is 19 whatever, 80 something or other. And there's a reason why I missed it. It's totally understandable that I missed it. I'm not being self-critical. It's OK. Compassion observer. I'm just noticing that you missed it. It's OK. There was, a, there was a professional, cultural context as to why I missed this diagnosis. So just watch that. At some point, I'll stop and go, OK, what do you think? What's the access one that I totally missed that now you totally get? And it's OK if you don't get it, because it's kind of in this particular tape, it's kind of subtle. So she's came for this kid. Dad's parents are wealthy. She's welfare. They're wealthy. 
So they diss her. They call the house the cave. Now it'll come out. This child has tantrums at times. She has these anxieties. But what really got her in the office when they were driving on the highway and the kid threatened to jump out. Okay, okay, anything else I need to tell you? I don't think so. Okay, here we go. Turn off the light back there. Thank you, thank you. Oh, let me get the camera to focus on the big screen directly. How do I do that? I do zoom, zoom. Okay. Uh, shades. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And please work, please work, please just work. She's eight. She just recently had a birthday. So far, so good. Sound is encouraging. <laughs> ah, visuals are encouraging. Press video. Video. Press play. Play. Meet Tara. Yes. Oh, sound is not happening. Ed, you were good last time at figuring out sound. Sound is only coming through there. It must be not attached. Mm. We got 91%. It's not attached at all because here's the cable. But isn't that to the computer? Well. Do you know how to do the sound? Perfect. Sorry for the delay, of course. Footnote, by the way. In those days, what I typically did is I'd see the kid individually for half an hour alone. And then I'd bring in, in this case, because there was issues between them, mom. There are those who would say it's not appropriate to be both the individual therapist and the conjoint therapist. If you're going to do that, what? That's gone. Where the speakers yeah. are is gone. So we got only what's in here. So, okay. Uh, so we're going to go to the other room. Right, unless we can this, figure this, out. Did this have a speaker? I mean, was there any sound at all? Yeah, but it's very little, and yeah. you're not going to hear it. that's all we got because there's no speaker built. I mean, it's gone. Yeah. Maybe okay. easier to ask if IT has a set of speakers they can bring in attention. But that's going to, but I'm so sorry. Yeah. But can we, can we just go over there because I'm sorry to make you guys all move. It's a hassle. Let's just do it because I want you to hear the tape. Should we take all stuff? I guess. Can we just stay there and, yeah. So sorry. Almost. Almost. God, it's just amazing. We try so hard. No, because you want it, and it won't come on this. Nobody else will be able to hear it. I'm so sorry to make you do that. It's such a drag. But there we have it. Okay, let's turn this off. Okay, thank you for your adaptive self. No, it'll be good. No, this will come in. What, what part of me came out when this happened? My, yeah, my Kvetcher. It was pretty low key Kvetcher. But inside I'm like, God, right, my inner Kvetcher. My little fushier. Fush, fush, fush. The fact that I can be a, remember I was called fushy because I fushed instead of fussed? The fact that I can be aware of that, the part of me that's aware of that, is not the Kvetcher. It's the president going, okay, I get it, it'll be all right. Options, here we go, we can do this. But sure, reflexing. It's interfering with my being a causative agent of my reality. I want you to see this. How hard is this? See, the Kvetcher's starting to come back. Again, as I was just mentioning, in this case, I saw minor first, then minor and mom together. You've got to be very conscious if you're going to do that because the danger is, what's the danger? You're jeopardizing what? Safety. Your alliance with the child, the individual. If you're an individual therapist, that's your client. You start doing conjoint. If you do classic conjoint, who is your client in the room? 
Not the child, not the mom or dad, but the relationship between them, as I always say when I do reunification therapy. That's my client, and usually I bring a little animal to represent that. Well, the, the client, 100% of the time, the client is, my ch is this child. In service of my client, I might do a collateral technique of conjoint therapy. But you've got to keep clear about who's your client and how is this serving your client. In this case, I think it worked well overall. I had a good alliance actually with both of them. In fact, one of the times I came and said, the mom says to me, you know, Tara did blah, blah, blah. And I told her, I, just wait, I'm going to tell Dr. Volkani on you. <laughs> and then Tara said, yeah. And I looked at her and I said, and I'm going to tell Dr. Volkani on you. That's when you know you have a mutual alliance. You're part of both their lives in that sense. In fact, that's one of the things you're going to hear me say, is you're both right. You'll keep hearing me say that. A footnote. The reason I saw them together, in good part, to, in service of my client, the child, is because there was a perhaps delay and or deviation in the individuation process because of enmeshment between mother and child. When you're doing separation work, you don't call it separation work. They will circle the wagons around you. Their perverse protectors will go, no, 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 bad. Bad therapist, you're trying to separate us. You're going to be all alone out here. You call it, and I, I don't think I used the term then, but I try to imply it, a new form of closeness. There's a <laughs> I like that. It's like, ha, yeah, like we're going to buy that. It's a new form of closeness. That's what you're doing. Okay? So, a lot to be aware of. Oh, this is the one, of course, that doesn't have the remote control. Quetch! <laughs> quetch, quetch. Please work. Are you there? Are you me? Uh, yeah. Wait, wait. A bear out of me. Oh, wow. A mink bear. I just got excited for something that's amazing. Where did you see that? On TV. Oh, this is on TV. Jeez. Think of all the poor little mink creatures that went into oh, making God. this one bear. Well, it was probably a bear itself. <laughs> oh, it was a bear itself, I guess. Gosh. This guy's uh, probably pure polyester, isn't that what you mean? I think he's probably. Okay, I'll be back in a half hour. Great. Stupid. Okay, as always, in here you decide um, what we're to do, and I just try to understand your thoughts and your feelings and your ideas and what's important to you. And if you'd like to talk, we'll do that. If you want to play, we'll do that. You decide. You can think or feel or say absolutely anything and do almost anything. What? Right, you, can, you can do it. You can decide however you want to do it. She knew we were doing a demonstration tape, obviously. You decided to play with a dog. She is eight. So again, she's eight. This is a little... Um, Again, I've worked with at least six months. I don't do that spiel every time, obviously. So she knows we're kind of doing like, well, what are you doing this for? Because it's a demo tape. So that's why I do this whole little segment. You'll see me be very reflective, and then you'll see me do other things. But I'll go back to the baseline of just reflect motor ideation affect. I was not a tradeologist like I am now. So I'm always hearing, I think, oh, should have, could have, would have. You should have said that. Yeah. It's OK. It's OK. This dog will eventually drive you out of your mind. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, okay. Well, maybe you'll have positive associations. She will eventually turn it off. You'll all go, ah, oh, when she dies. Yes? Why was she in therapy or why was she? Anxiety, oppositionality, whininess. You'll hear her whining. Yeah. But when she was about to jump out of the car, Okay. On the highway, that went beyond whininess. Okay. Her and the creature can come out as well. Okay, okay. You're going to turn it on. He's walking away. <laughs> <laughs> 
trip over the lake. His leash, his and her leash, he used to have a dog. He used to have a dog? Oh. Yeah, he was really good, but we had to kill him. The last night of fish Oh, wow, you had a dog named Ribbon. And you had to sell him. And last night of fish died. And last night your fish died. That was really sad for you. I'm not going to just keep stopping this time, but it's an important point. Kid tells you an animal dies, you pay attention. That's huge in their lives. Huge. I told you, sometimes when I do the island test, not really a test, task. You know, here's, I draw the island, I draw the little hut and the palm tree and the perfect right peeling over here, the ones on my wedding ring. I say, where are you on the island? I do this with custody things. Oh, over here. You can have one person, I told you this one, only one person who would be the one person in the entire universe you'd have with you on that island. Talk about primary object. Fliffles. Ah, uh, Fliffle. Who's Fliffle? My dog. Oh, oh, okay. Where do you want Fliffle? Right next to me. Right, I drop. Pets are unbelievably important. Unbelievably important. Orbital frontal lobe connection. The way you look at your little golden retriever puppy is the way you looked at your mother's eyes when you were three months old. That's how it is. So when she says, you look at that face, look at that face, oh my God, this is big. She, on the other hand, isn't supplying the, if one might say, dare say, the appropriate affect. So I am going to help supply for her. Remember therapy, never mind bionic, but uh, bionic, bionic, bionic therapist, <laughs> bionic. A kid did a bionic gorilla play yesterday, it was really cute. You are, you, you're also jamming together, so you can supply the affect that's probably being protected from. She's protecting herself, one might hypothesize. That might be some of the reasons why she has scary things in the closet, right? A projection, because she has to protect, and then it's like, ah, oh, the shadow comes back. So I supply appropriate affect. Oh, that must have been really sad, and I want to know about these fish. When she said we had a dog, and I had to give it away. Whoa, whoa, let me guess. I don't think she said, you know, I'm tired of this dog, let's give it away. I don't think that's what happened. I think a parent probably took it away. I'm not saying bad parent. She's going to have really strong feelings about that. And I want to help her express those feelings. Be unimonic. Be able to synthesize, integrate. This is kind of very classical concepts of therapy. And you'll see me doing a lot of that with her. I was sad. What was your fish's name? Max and Oh, there were two. There were two One is still alive? Both. Both of your fish died? Oh. We only had them for at least a month. Oh, you had them for at least a month and they both had, you know, what they died of? Well, I said it was Tilly's fault, our cat's fault, my oh. fault, and mom's fault. His mommy didn't clean him too much. And I kept telling you that I ate them a little too much. Oh, wow. Until you drink the water. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so between being overfed, underclean, and dewaterized, they didn't have much of a chance. But I bet that's real sad. I, I used to feel very sad. I remember when I almost lost, I did lose my dog once, but I re it. And that was very sad for me. I remember one time when I. A cat I had died. It was very sad. I do yeah. that. Huh. Do you have a lot of you and yeah. Just a footnote. I will normalize her behaviors sometimes by putting it on me. I, you'll see me do that later on also. She'll do a thing about it. Ooh, I have, somebody said I have fangs like a vampire. And I said, oh yeah, I got fangs too. Normalize. Yeah. So when she says, says, oh, especially if she's hiding from affect. I want to say, hey, God, are you can't. And, and by the way, it is true. I did have a dog. I know that. I know where you come from, baby. It's okay to feel all that you're feeling. Wait, which one is it? Is this a... Why gave away the dog? Uh, how long did you have it before you had to give it away? Oh, so you had it for six months. So you were really attached to it, I bet. When was it? It was about when I was six years old. Now. So about two years ago. Yeah. 
See how our heads are going together? Yeah. Now we're by Monic. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a helpless feeling, you know, when you're a little kid and you can't control what happens. Grown-ups make the decision, you know, your dad decides, like, oh, she's going, huh? And you're like, I don't know where to go. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So that's the fiance, the Jungian part of me, whatever. The ritual, rituals are really important in human functioning. She doesn't particularly like it. Notice that this therapy is more directive or suggestive. I'm making suggestions of things she could do. There's skill acquisition involved. The latency, they can acquire skills, whether it's cognitive behavioral stuff, or out in the world stuff. So I'm, I'm much more directive that way. One, sorry. I was just wondering, when you're talking about like, I bet you're angry or I bet you were having these feelings, are you saying that in order for her, like to actually find out or to help her learn how to label the way she was feeling? The latter. I'm not asking. I'm, I bet you did. Right. It's a kind of a directive. It's saying, it's, it's trying to be, again, we're witnesses, right? Mm -hmm. We are definers. We're helping them define who they are. And we are joiners. In that moment, I'm being a definer. Is I'm there a risk in that? Like in, in well, the risk would be that, that I'm they suggesting. feel the way they should, or you would expect them to have? Will they argue with me and say, no, I didn't feel that way? Absolutely on both. Okay. Right. The danger is I'm putting mine on yours. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the good news is, no. In fact, you'll hear her later. It's amazing. Later on, I, I say something. I thought she drew a shark. I said, is that a shark? And you can tell, like, I want you to be a shark because that would be meaningful. She goes, no. <laughs> oh. And you can see I'm almost disappointed. They, it's amazing. If they feel safe in the relationship, and it's always imperfect, mm -hmm. they will speak their heart. No. Nobody's home, Balkani. No, I don't. But look at it already. No, I, I've already made some suggestions. I thought, you know, maybe she would do the play dog thing. No, I'm not doing the dog thing, dude. Hey, maybe you want to make a little sculpture? She has a whole Terra collection here, these little passing things she's done. You can put your little things or drawing, whatever. No. She just kind of looks at me, that's nice. No, I'm not doing it. I get the concept. So I'm secure that she will speak her heart. Okay. Yeah, it's trying to define her. Another footnote, by the way. Because self-consciousness, those areas of the brain, area 10, whatever, are more and more building, Pure reflection can seem intrusive. I told you about my 10-year-old who ended up literally field position in the corner of the room. I see you in the corner of the room. This must be uncomfortable for you. Don't say that! It's like a magnifying glass in the sun. It's like, ow! Because they're already self-reflecting. Now it's like, ah! And they've got the inner critic going, so they can easily, in amygdalation, they can easily think you're being critical, judgmental of them. He wanted to play basketball. Okay, we'll go outside, we'll play basketball. It's joining in a different way at times. I love Yeah, you You've had a lot of cats, too. Very prefrontal cortex. So she's saying cat, a cat that was, the mom had when she was pregnant, that counts as one of my cats. Cats that mom had when she's a kid doesn't count. That's classic prefrontal cortex. Latency, you're just seeing it all over the place. Oh, Tilly 
so you like her, but at the same time you're a little annoyed with her for drinking out of the pool. Yeah. yeah. So that's the two sides. You like her, but you're annoyed for drinking. I got her out of the fish. Oh. It's amazing she didn't actually eat the fish. Well, I know. I'm scared of You were scared of Yeah, I bet. Oh, yeah. And um, today uh, we practiced a putt. Oh. And I spoke. And we're going to do a nine. I'm, well, the one that I said I was going to be called Bobby in the plane nine. So one of the binds for me as a therapist at this stage, they are so oriented again towards peers and acknowledgement, acculturation, all that. So oriented towards being competent, agents of causativity. So they're thrilled. I'm in a play. I'm in a play. In those days, it was really hard for me to simply say, oh, awesome, high five. Why is that? Why would I worry about doing that? It's conditional. Unconditional positive regard. Whether you're the star of the play, or you didn't get in the play, whether you hit the home run, whether you struck out, it's not about that at all. It's about you. <laughs> All that matters is your world and your family. I can see it's really sappy. I can see it's really, mmm. You hear me say, mmm. I'm like, ah. Uh. That sounds like it's really exciting for you. And that's pretty good. That's more in the defining mode. What they want you to be at that moment is in the joining mode. Mm -hmm. High five, awesome. Bet that felt great. So I can still say, bet that felt great. A or an F, got it, but. Because they want you to join them in that. But the danger is, and they do do this, all of us did this, we mistook performance for value. Every one of us, I told you that the first day, that's why don't perform for me, which is totally contra everything you've learned, that you perform for the teacher, that you're great if you get, remember that little exercise I did with the A, that removed the line, I said you're no more valuable whether you got an A or an F. You, I don't totally believe that. Remember when I read you Kuala Lu? Remember Kuala Lu, she wanted to win the Olympics so mom would finally love her again? What stage of life is she likely to have been in? Latency. It's all about performance. It's all about culturation. Mommy, look, 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 but still attached to mom, still cares. You think a teenager would care whether her mom loved him or not in that overt way? No. She's latency. So that's one of the dilemmas for therapists, it seems to me, in this state. For me now, I do join them much more. It's okay. And I can still say, I know it's sad for you when you didn't get in the play or you struck out, it must have felt so bad. Hard to imagine you're still just as lovable whether you get an A and F, whether you get a strike out a home run. I get it. I care about you either way. Okay, moving on.
you're gone, then you're real scared, I guess. Mommy, mommy, where are you? And then you find when you feel real relieved. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Wolfa, do you ever get lost? Yes, I sometimes get lost. I get scared when I get lost. Oh, it's real scary. See, she's I smiling. My mom, I feel safe. And my dad, too. I want to keep taking good care of. You're going over there. What's the thing? Oh, Bear, will you protect me if I ever have any problems? If I ever get lost? Or if I ever get bad things happen to me? Yes, I'll protect you. Don't worry, dog. I'll protect you. Oh, good. Very intentionally done. Notice. Talking about a lot of darkness. Dead dogs, dead fish, bad things happening. There was at least one rescue dog. I could have said something more about. On the one hand, there's dark stuff, but at least there's light, and this little dog you got rescued, but either way. She then goes to Christmas and this other stuff. Now, I'm doing a little bit like Eckstein. Remember the wanna dance, wanna talk? Because she's now way over here. I actually very directively pull her back. I actually say, oh, by the way, so that's about finding things we ever lost. Because there's all this loss. I'm wondering, well, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe she got lost. I better ask her. So then she goes into the linoleum store thing, and, but then mommy's always there. I mean, it's a metaphor in a way. I'm gone, but then I find her. Okay, good. I then try the dog again. Dog's right there. And this time, she goes for it. I talk to the dog, and she's smiling. I look up at her face. She is smiling. Then she goes over and does this. Now she's really into this. Good, this is fine. Oh, he goes to the bear. I am going to say, and this is directive, I will protect you, you're safe with me, all of that. Because I want to say, yes, the world can be scary and dangerous, but yes, there's protection. Yes, there are big bears, they're much bigger than little puppies that can take care of you. Because you want to foster optimism, resiliency. The real, real, real reality, thank God, knock on wood, see the old superstitious mind in all of us? All of us are going to make it home tonight. I know every one of you wants to knock on wood. The probabilities are so great. Thank you. And yes, buckle your seatbelt. And yes, I hope you have a car with an airbag. And don't go 158 miles an hour. Duh. Lightness is greater than darkness, but they need to be reminded when they're scared like that. Okay? So it's very, very specific intentional. You guys are ready for a break. I'm so sorry to do this to you. Please take a 10 minute break and come back. I want you to see this whole tape. We only have one more session together. Go, come back by 20 after, please. Thank you.